Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Ryan Levesque who's one of the legends of copywriting and marketing. He is a master at setting up marketing funnels that convert cold traffic into customers which is what everyone wants. He's the founder of the Survey Funnel Formula. Now he's used this exact formula to generate just brace yourself for a second. These are big numbers. 2.8 million leads, 175,000 customers in 17 markets. And that's not over 10 years. That's in 23 months alone. And I saw Ryan, we went to an event this past weekend. And, you know, I was talking to a few high level entrepreneurs. When I'm talking to them, you know, I'm asking, what's working? What are you doing? And they kind of, one person in particular kind of put their head down and you get this whisper and you know it's going to be something really good. And uh, like, you know, I started working with, with Ryan Levesque and he's doing the survey funnel formula. One of those whispers that, you know, he kind of reveals something and he doesn't necessarily want everyone to know about it. So Ryan, I'm really excited to have you. Thank you for joining me. Jeremy, it's awesome to connect. It was great to meet you at Titans of Direct Response. And I'm looking forward to continuing the great conversation that we started. Now, I want to, you know, I'm really excited to hear big lessons learn big mistakes what works what doesn't work i always like to get a fun fact about someone most you know something most people don't know and we were talking a little bit about you speak another language tell me about that yeah so this is completely random uh based on what i do now but i actually speak nearly fluent chinese and it's a function of a couple of things. I, I studied Chinese in college. I did some graduate studies in Chinese language and I actually lived in China for almost five years. So it feels like it's a lifetime ago, but it's uh, something that I've carried with me today. And what's interesting, just to tie that back to our conversation today, is that when you learn a language and you become fluent in a language, one of the skills that you learn is not only the vocabulary, the terminology that you're learning, but the ability to mimic a native Chinese speaker. And so I always tell people I, was never the, I never had the widest vocabulary when I spoke Chinese, but my secret party trick was I could call up anybody, any Chinese person on the phone and speak to them and say, hey, in Chinese, hey, let's meet on the corner of the street in five minutes, blah, blah, blah. If they didn't know who I was, they would go on that street corner and they were expecting a Chinese person. I had this unique ability that I could really mimic a native, China speak, native Chinese speaker's sound. And I think the way that that works in a marketing context, which is interesting when you sort of draw these parallels, is that the methodology that I use is, hinges on your ability to emulate the way a consumer speaks in a specific market. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail, but I think it's an interesting parallel for anybody who studied a foreign language before where you can understand and appreciate that part of the secret, part of the magic is being able to, to do that, to sound like someone in your market. And you have another interesting fun fact, but before that one, just what can you say in China? It's got to be a really difficult language to learn. Will you just say whatever sentence in Chinese just so I can... People can grasp, yeah. Sure. And what did you Maybe what I just said is, if you'd like, we can do the rest of the interview in Chinese. <laughs> How about it? <laughs> and you could have said anything and I wouldn't know what you said. Exactly, anyways, right? Just nonsense. <laughs> you know, Chinese is a great language. We could talk about it all day. But I know there's, uh, you know, some other stuff we want to talk about. Um, uh, your other fun yeah, fact. Yeah, you're talking about the... Yeah. yeah. This so is a crazy a, one. <laughs> So crazy one, um, this is going to be really crazy. So um, when I turned 30 years old, right before I turned 30 years old, this was a couple years ago, right before I turned 30 years old, I was working really hard and I lost a whole bunch of weight and I was having all these really weird medical symptoms and I just attributed it to the fact that I was working really hard, not working out, not taking good care of my body and this was shortly after my son was born. And uh, at the time, uh, since my son was born, I decided to apply for a life insurance policy. Well, anyways, I went to a marketing conference, came back from the marketing conference to a pile of mail, opened up that mail, opened up a letter to my life insurance uh, results, and was rejected. Hmm. I was rejected because uh, my lab results were off the charts. 
And so I started doing a little bit of research and uh, found out what was going on. I didn't believe it. So I went to the doctor to corroborate the results and the lab results came out exactly the same to the point that the doctor said, listen, you need to go to the emergency room now and you're not driving yourself. Wow. Long story short, I had fallen into this condition that's known as DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a condition that most people find out about when they slip into a coma. And basically the doctor said I was days away from slipping into a coma. And what exactly was happening is that at 30 years old, I found out that I was diagnosed, become, became a type 1 diabetic. Type 1 diabetes is also known as juvenile diabetes. Right. It's basically what people, people mostly You're born find out they're it. a juvenile diabetic when they're a kid. Yeah. It's extremely rare, like one in a million to find out that you have this when you're uh, in your 30s. So long story short, I was hospitalized. I was in the ICU for a week. They pumped me with almost 20 pounds of fluid to rebalance my electrolytes. I lost all this weight and uh, became, really, really came close to dying. Um, it really was pretty serious. Two years later, three years later, I'm actually healthier than I've ever been, before, you know, in my life. But it's interesting that it, it when you when you reach a uh, when you get to your uh, when you come face to face with your mortality like that, it forces you to ask questions about your life and really, are you pushing yourself? Are you working to your full potential? And I almost credit that experience to the type of success that I've had really since then because. Again, when you're forced to come to terms with your own mortality like that, you realize you're not around forever. And then if you're going to do what you want to do, you better do it now because you're not guaranteed that time that you think you might have. So it's a case of making lemonade out of lemons for sure. And I look back and I think about it literally every single day. And I think I'm thankful that I'm still around for obvious reasons, but I also look at it as a point of inspiration to, to really maximize each day, maximize each week, and maximize each year. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful, and it's a big driving force. And I want, you know, we're going to talk about where you were and how you got to where you are now. Um, what's the one thing that you can teach the audience right now to get them a quick win, some results on how to convert a cold, you know, some cold traffic into a customer? Absolutely. So uh, we're going to talk about things in a little bit more detail. Basically, I'm the survey guy, and I use surveys in a whole different number of areas in my marketing. But I want to give people a super easy, quick thing that you can do in your business right now. And basically, it's this. If you're doing any sort of email marketing, in addition to that first email that you send after somebody signs up for your list, on that same day, send a second email. This email is going to be very short, and all it's going to say in the subject line is, hey, did you get my email? And in the, sub, and in the body of the email, you're going to say, hey, it's, and I'm just going to word it like it was coming from me, hey, it's Ryan here, and earlier today I shot you an email with some information that you'd asked for, and I just wanted to make sure that it went to the right place. Can you, this is the, these are the magic words, can you do me a favor and please just, in all caps, hit reply to this email to let me know that you got it. It would mean the absolute world to me. Okay, I'll leave you with that for now. Take care, Ryan. Now here's the reason why you do this. I wanna give you three reasons why you do this. Number one, surveys for me are just a mechanism for getting feedback from your market. This is one of the best ways, easy ways to get feedback from your market. You're actually getting a response. The hit reply mechanism is key. You don't wanna send people to a link. You want it to feel as informal as possible. So you're getting response. Number two, it gives you an opportunity to engage with your audience. So when they respond to you, you either want to respond to them or you want to be sending these emails to a person on your team that can respond. Because when you create this two-way conversation, it completely transforms your relationship with your prospective customers. Right. And number three, this is the ninja one. This is the absolute best whitelisting technique you'll ever use. Because here's the thing. The Gmails of the world, the Yahoo mails of the world, the Hotmails of the world, what they're looking to do is they're looking to separate marketing communication from typical two-way communication. And when you create this back and forth reply, reply scenario, all of a sudden Gmail says, this isn't a marketing message. This is a personal email that this person's responding to, and you have whitelisted yourself. It is better than asking your prospects to whitelist you, to set up a separate email box. So it's this th triple threat technique, which is so simple to do. It's like a five-line email. So anybody who's listening to this interview, I challenge you immediately after we finish talking about what we're going to be talking about today mm. to go into your email service provider and set this up right now. You will be amazed with the type of feedback that 
you will get. And I'll talk about some specific client examples where I've done this sort of thing and the type of financial impact that this one tiny little technique has. Mm. And we haven't even scratched the surface on what we're really going to be talking about today, which is surveys. Yeah. And we could stop the interview right now. That's that's more than enough for people. Done. All right. <laughs> out. <laughs> Secret out. <laughs> that, this is valuable in itself. And um, we'll get a little bit deeper in this. I want to know, you know, and I don't ask this question lightly, Ryan. Okay. What was some of your big takeaways for the Titans event? And how you're going to use them, and I, I say I don't I don't ask it lightly is because you spent tons of time, tons of money, time away from your family to get these big insights. Um, so what was what was some of those that you can share? So I'll talk uh, specifically as it relates to my business, mm. and people can take that and kind of think about how they might apply it to their business. Mm. So for me, the biggest challenge that I have in my business right now is not demand. I literally have a wait list for people who want to work with me that stretches a year into the future. And I have people who want to start projects in July of 2015 basically saying, Ryan, I have a project. It's going to get off the ground. I want to block time off in your implementation calendar, and I will pay you money now to reserve that spot. So demand is not an issue. The biggest challenge that I have in my business is scaling. I'm in a business right now where a lot of the intellectual capital is tied up in my mind. And the biggest takeaway that I had for me is that I need to do a better job of building out and formalizing the process so I can transfer some of that to the rest of my team. And I have a 12-person team, so I have a, a, a small but a decent-sized organization that I work with, but I still haven't done a good enough job. So very specifically, Joe Polish, who was at the event, asked people uh, in the VIP session to – to two things. Number one, write down in a single sentence what is it exactly that you're going to be doing as a result of the event. And I'll explain what my sentence is in a moment. Yeah. And then boil that down to one single word. So the takeaway for me very specifically is to systematize my process by doing three things. Mm -hmm. By hiring a process consultant to come into my company to document our existing processes and better train future people coming into our organization. To sign up for Strategic Coach, which is uh, Dan Sullivan's program. And number three, to work with a company called Stroll. Uh, a friend of mine is the CEO of Stroll. His name is Dan Reutman. And Dan Roy runs an $85 million business. They run Pimsleur Approach, which is probably their mm -hmm. most famous product. They have done a tremendous job at systematizing their business. So the takeaway there is modeling someone who's reached a level of success that you want to approach. Mm -hmm. And so that boils down to the single word, process. That by far, if I could sum things down into a single sentence or paragraph, summarizes for me personally the single biggest takeaway that I walked away with uh, having attended the event. Yeah. And Ryan, this is the scary part. If people like you are worried about systemizing because everything you do from anyone looking is so systemized, it's scary that that's what you have to work on. You're absolutely right. It's, uh, it, it's, it's sort of a function of almost like it's the strengths finder model, right? It's finding what you do well and it, you know, it's all relative, right? Yes. My business is not well systematized relative to Dan Reutman's business, stroll.com. They've mm -hmm. been able to grow their business to 85 million. I don't have an $85 million business yet. At the same time, a business that's struggling to go from six to seven figures, I'm probably a little bit better systematized than they are because of the narrow focus that I operate in. So it really is just a relative basis. And the same thing mm -hmm. for someone who's looking to go from nothing to six figures, you know, is going to look to a business that's achieved that level of success. So I think the big takeaway there is find someone, whether that's at the organizational level or the individual level, that you can model. And a piece, a big takeaway that I'm going to leave people with, because I've made this mistake before, and I think it's relevant, relevant to what we're talking about now, which is when you're following someone, you're looking for someone as your paradigm of success, someone that you want to model, don't look at what they're doing now after ha having achieved that level of success. That's a mistake. Don't look at what Mark Cuban is doing now. Don't look at what Richard Branson is doing now, whoever your business hero is. Right. Look at what it, what it took to get them from A to B, yeah. not from Y to Z. Look at what they did 25 years ago where they were one step ahead of where you are now. It's important because yeah. otherwise you get caught up and you think the key is to drive a Lamborghini, to live in a right. huge 20,000 square foot mansion. That's not the answer. That's what you do after you've arrived. Right. But to do 
what to, you need to know what you need to do to arrive, and for that you need to look historically. So I think that's a real important takeaway. I make this mistake all the time, and I try to remind myself to focus on the right part of the process. Yeah, that's a really good point because if you look at what's this eighty-five million dollar company doing. It may not give you all the answers, but from where you are to where where they were at that point, and and that brings me up the question. So, what system have you implemented in your business that made a huge uh, effect that you've already implemented? When you say system, are you talking about a specific type of software, or a specific methodology? Yeah, anything that you saw that something was inefficient in your business, and you put something in place. Okay, so I read a book, and it's a great book for anyone who's listening to this right now who wants to go down this path. The name of the book is called Built to Sell. Are you familiar with the book, Jeremy? Yes, yes. Okay, so it's basically it's a, a business parable about a creative agency that was doing a whole bunch of different things and was getting caught up in the trap of catering to really big, we'll call them whale, clients at the expense of the stuff that they did really well. And the net effect was that they were doing a lot of different things, but none of those things they were doing really well at a world-class level. Well, when I read that book a few years ago, it, it, along with several other books, it had a profound impact on me and made me realize that I was doing a lot of things well, mm -hmm. but I wasn't doing any one single thing where I was the best in the world. When you couple that with other books like Richard Koch, and I know I butchered his last 80, name. 80, 20, know, Koch, yes, yes. Yeah, Koch, yeah. Yes. Uh, if, you, if you read his book, The Star Principle, yes. if you read the book, Blue Ocean Strategy, yeah. they all get at the same idea just from different angles, which is this. Pick that inch-wide, mile-deep space that you can own, something that you can become the best in the world at, and that starts at a process-oriented direction. So for me, I am the best person in the world, and I will fight you tooth and nail if you disagree with me on this, at building out survey funnel sales funnels. It's what I do all day, every day. I do it at all levels. I work at the six-figure level where I do bespoke, high-end, personal client implementations. I do coaching, and I also have training products that teach people on the methodology. This is my inch-wide, mile-deep space that yeah. I own, and I know better than everybody else. And so I started making a decision a few years ago yeah. when it, with respect to systematizing to do less of the other stuff, to be less of a general marketing consultant, to be less of a general sales funnel consultant or sales funnel implementer at the expense of uh, doing all the other things, I decided to focus on this tiny little narrow space. And I would advocate, it's an uncomfortable decision to make because it's scary to mm. say no to income that's coming in from other places. Mm. But I would suggest reading those three books, reading Built to Sell, reading The Star Principle, yeah. reading Blue Ocean Strategy. And I think that after you go through that process, you'll reconsider if you're going in that direction, you know, instead, you know, pursuing that inch wide, mile deep space, whatever it might be for, for your yeah. business. Yeah. The Star Principle is phenomenal. I wrote down Blue Ocean Strategy because I'm going to have to, to listen to that one too. Um, and you know, you were mentioning a few things um, with what you just said and about being best in the world. When you asked yourself that question, you could have gone in different directions. How did you come to be the best in the world at the funnel, survey funnels? It's a great question. It's obviously not one thing that, um, that leads you to that path, but I'll tell you for me sort of what that path involved. So I actually have an academic background in neuroscience. I studied and taught neuroscience at the Ivy League level at, at Brown University. And that's what I did prior to going into Wall Street, prior to working in China, prior to, prior to getting into direct response. So I've always been fascinated around the uh, psychology of investors, the, the acute consumer psychology. So I've always had that natural proclivity or interest in that direction. That led me to a mentor by the name of Dr. Glenn Livingston. Dr. Glenn Livingston, for anyone who's not familiar, is probably the most influential person that I've had in my business life. He is a marketing psychologist that Fortune 100 companies would bring through into their companies to do these deep dive survey-oriented research projects to come up with these multi-million dollar brand names. And these are companies like Nabisco, Pfizer, AT&T, companies that we've all heard of, and brand names that everybody on this call is going to be familiar with. For example, one that comes to mind immediately is the, the cookie company or cookie brand, Chips Ahoy. You think, how did they come up with the name Chips Ahoy? Right. Well, it's based on this statistically oriented, very deep dive research process where Nabisco paid Glenn and his team you know, a, a, over a million dollars to do his deep dive research process. Well, 
Glenn started teaching that process in an online environment, and I ended up working with Glenn for two years, mentoring under him, studying under him, and eventually coaching people through his methodology. And that was sort of the underpinnings of what I do now, which is very much sur survey-oriented. Mm -hmm. My methodology is an outgrowth of working with Glenn, and the reason why I was attracted to Glenn in the first place is because he's you know, a, a PhD-trained brain scientist. Right. Um, so we had the same sort of academic interest, and I trusted the direction that he was coming from. Right. So that sort of went in that direction. Now, why did I pursue the business model that I pursued? Well, that comes down to recognizing what your strengths are. Right. So for me, I've, I'm a big fan, being the survey guy, of taking uh, strength-based strength assessments. So I'm a big fan of understanding what, is it, what it is that makes you tick. So I've taken the Strengths Finder test. I've taken many Myers-Briggs tests. I've taken, taken the Wealth Dynamics test. I've taken Colby test. And it's all designed to better understand who you are so you can maximize your strengths and focus in on what you do well. I know my Strengths my strength Finder test, I took it probably 10 years ago and I still know my strengths. In order, they're focus, futuristic, intellection, learner, and significance. And I've made it a point in my business to focus on something that allows me to express what those strengths are. So what that means at a very granular level is I like to operate in these detailed, very uh, sort of heady places, the intellection, the learner side of things. I'm very focused, so I can do things that people tend to get distracted about. I'm very good at putting myself in that situation. At the same time, it also means... Uh, that I'm more of an introvert. So I spend a tremendous amount of time, even though I spend a lot of time on the phone with clients now, I'm actually in a room by myself 90% of the time. Hmm. So I don't have a large team around me that's reporting to me in person. My team is all virtual. So I've built my business, designed my process in such a way that allows me to derive energy from what I do. And I'm just describing this just from my own perspective. For sure, yeah. You know, it's going to be different for you. It's going to be different yeah. for the person on the call. But this is the framework, the mental hmm. framework that I've used to kind of guide the path that I've sort of yeah. pursued. I think, you know, I asked that question about myself on a weekly basis. So I was just interested in hearing your answer because I think it's one of the most important questions that I ask myself. And you also have a mastermind of your own. Tell us about the Oceans Mastermind. Sure. Um, so I have, I have a, a, a few different masterminds. So I have a, um, I, wanna, I don't want to say it's a low level mastermind, but it's a, a basic level mastermind that like involves a lower a barrier to entry, maybe lower barrier to entry mastermind, which yeah. is a, a two hundred dollar a month mastermind. It's a, a Facebook group and it gives access to some 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 training where I bring in experts and, and sort of a monthly mastermind call as well as access to my software that I sell. So I have that mastermind. I have a group coaching mastermind, which is an event that I run three times a year live in Austin, as well as some uh, direct interaction with me. And then the highest level, the mastermind that, that you were interested in is something that I call what that we that we call the oceans for elite high-level mastermind this is an event that people pay upwards of ten thousand dollars to spend a weekend with us I run the event with three other marketers um, folks that some people might be familiar with Andre chaperone who's an email marketer Ben settle who's a tremendous copywriter and also an email expert in his own right and Jack Bourne who's a, a, a technical partner of mine who's developed a number of different software tools including AW Pro tools and so we collectively have different strengths I'm the funnel guy we've got an email guy we've got a copywriter we've got the technical guy and what we do is we we bring businesses from a whole bunch of different niches and we teach people how to re-engineer their marketing funnel and we do it over the course of the weekend through a hot seat style mastermind where we spend some time before the event going deep inside someone's business. We ask them a number of different questions. We look at their existing funnels. We rip it apart, tear it to shreds. And then when we get to the mastermind in person together, we've run these things in uh, Las Vegas, in San Diego, in Miami, and the one that we have coming up, which, is, uh, which, which sold out uh, weeks after we made it available and it's, it's, it's filled up is in Austin, Texas, which is my home city. Um, we, we, we basically tell them how to re-engineer their, um, their, their business funnel. Um, and it's a tremendous event. It's a lot of fun. We get together and it's all seven and eight figure marketers basically looking to grow their business. Yeah. I mean, and one common theme you keep mentioning over and over is mentors and masterminding. What's a big takeaway you've gotten from, because I'm sure even though you're holding the mastermind, you probably learn a ton from breaking down all these people's businesses. What's a big takeaway from one of the Ocean's mastermind? Well, I'll tell you more broadly, one of the secrets to my success is uh, we get to focus and then we talk about uh, diversification. I'm in, right now, it's actually 25 different markets. 
So I'm in the golf training market. I'm in the uh, tennis education market, the dog training market. I'm in satellite TV. I'm in business funding. I'm in memory improvement. I'm in weight loss. I'm in fitness. I'm in beekeeping. I'm in the cheating spouse market. I'm in the pickup artist market. I'm getting into the survival market. I'm in the software as a service market. I'm all, in all these different markets. It's a good people, thing you are in the memory market because exactly. that alone is... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So there's a little sort of schizophrenia to this, and I'm going to get to the answer to your question yeah. in a moment, but it sort of sets the stage for this. But the reason why why my methodology is successful as it is, is because I do this inch wide, mile deep thing. That's my expertise. That's my process. But I'm able to apply it in all these different scenarios. And when you're able to do that, when you're able to see commonalities across different markets and you're studying different markets, yeah. this gets to the direct answer to your question. The biggest takeaway that I get both from that and the masterminds that I run, in the mastermind that we run, the Oceans 4 Elite Mastermind, is we mandate, we have a mandate that we only allow one person from each market. Yeah. We do that for a couple of different reasons. Number one, we do that so that there are no competitive uh, uh, conflicts in yeah. the room. People don't want to share. Can, yeah. Exactly. Yep. So there's that. But then the second thing, and almost more importantly than that, is the diversity of markets. This is where the big opportunity is today. To find something that's working in this market and apply it in a different market where nobody is applying that technique. Yeah, yeah. That's where you make leaps and bounds in your business. And so I see that all day, every day in the client work that I do, I'm able to apply something from the survival niche into the dog training niche mm. or from the tenant in the tennis niche into satellite TV because the people that operate only in their specific industry, yeah. they don't see what's going on in all these spaces. And the oceans for elite mastermind is a way for people to have a window into what's going on in all these other businesses in a way that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. For me, this is my way of life. I operate in all these spaces. Yeah. If you're running a full business, you can't spend time in all these different markets. But the weekend where we do these in-depth, detailed, hot seat weekends, it gives people a glimpse into what's working in these other markets. They walk, they go home, they take away what's working, and then they can apply it in their business. So that's probably the biggest takeaway from yeah. the uh, Oceans for Elite Mastermind. Yeah. yeah, Ryan, so I could tell you and Perry Marshall are probably very good friends with the 80-20 and you know, with his talk talking about you get those insi big insights with a company from the outside. Um, so beekeeping, that's pretty random. It's random. So funny aside, Perry is also a client of mine. And it's funny how these things go full circle. So just to, and I'll get to the beekeeping thing, which yeah. is really interesting. So Glenn Livingston, I mentioned his name. He first was, I was first a customer of his. I bought one of his $17 products. By his two thousand dollar trim, I think I beat to hell. It was a box that was totally destroyed. The DVD cases in it were completely destroyed. And I started my relationship with Glenn first as a customer from afar. Then I became a private coaching client of his. Then we became business partners, and now we're friends. Uh, we're close friends, and we've done a number of hikes together. Now, going back to how this relates to Perry, the reason why I uh, so the reason why Perry is a customer is very interesting. So Perry is who Glenn learned from. Perry is Glenn's mentor in the marketing oh, wow. lineage, and Perry obviously learned from Dan Kennedy. So I invested in Perry's programs when he was still the AdWords guy, and I started studying him 10 years ago, and I became part of his mastermind. I invested in his higher programs, mm. and I became partners with his marketing manager, Mr. Jack Bourne, my technical partner, and that led to Perry becoming a customer of mine. So it's really interesting how these things become sort of full circle where someone's a customer of yours. Now, to answer your question on the beekeeping side of things, absolutely. So beekeeping is just one of a great random market where I'm working with someone who, and this was going back uh, several years now, uh, work with someone who wanted to get into a new market. They didn't know what market they wanted to get into, but again, they wanted to go in with this theme of taking this inch wide mile deep space and dominating it. Now, the client that I work with in this space, his financial goals were a little bit more modest and he wasn't looking to build this eight figure financial empire. He really just wanted to build a lifestyle business that would help pay for the lifestyle of his family. Mm -hmm. So we went through my process that I go through. We narrowed down a number of different possibilities and long story short, we identified the beekeeping niche of all places. Wow. At place a space that we could own and to this day he's the number one player in the beekeeping space as random as it sounds and that's just one that you know uh, just kind of came to mind so yeah. it really just goes to show you that there's no market that the methodology that sort of I work in doesn't work in from beekeeping to satellite TV to skincare to weight loss and everything in between yeah yeah you know, so Ryan yeah I'm gonna, we'll 
talk about some of the funnels and everything like that, but I wanted to find out a little bit more about you and kind of what makes you tick because this is so interesting. Where are you from? What was it like growing up? Sure. Great question. So uh, right now I'm in Austin, Texas, my home, my hometown now. We've been in Austin for I think six years, about six years. Before that we lived in China. Mm. Uh, before that I lived in, uh, in New York City in, in Manhattan when I was still working on Wall Street. Um, but I actually, uh, I actually come, I was born and raised in New Hampshire. Grew up in a small town. Uh, I come from a, a blue collar background. I'm the first person ever in my family to oh. uh, go to college. Uh, neither of my parents went to college. And, and I think, I talk about this all the time, I think one of the keys to why I've been fortunate enough to have the level of success that I have is that I'm, I'm not that smart. And I say this because my mentor, Glenn, Dr. Glenn Livingston, um, in some ways I tell people that Glenn's almost too smart. He's a concert pianist. He's a chess grandmaster. And, for, and, he, and he grew up in a family of 17 PhD psychologists. Wow. When you're in that type of environment, it becomes more of a challenge to relate to the everyman. I grew up with people who dropped out of high school. I'm by far, and I don't say this to brag or boast, but I'm by far the most financially the most successful person in my hometown probably ever. Um, and it's coming from that working class blue collar background. Yeah. When you can combine that and that ability to empathize and relate to the quote unquote everyman and couple that with sort of the more sophisticated, sort of more brain oriented, more statistically oriented process, it creates almost this perfect storm where you still have the benefit of that Gary Halbert style copy, media use style form of communication that's not too intellectual. Mm -hmm. And you combine that with these sort of more you know, sophisticated modeling techniques, which is what we operate in. It really creates uh, an environment that you can, you, know, you can do well in. So I grew up blue, blue collar. Um, I had no idea what the hell I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, and uh, you know, here we are having this. Yeah, having so this how did you get Dr. from... Dr. Yeah, how did you get from there to neuroscience? What was it? Did you have uh, you know some goals in mind early on of well, you know, I'm just going to do this job because that's what my family does or what was it like? What were you what were your aspirations then? I mean, it really came down to at the time in high school, um, at that time I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And I was really interested in the brain. And I actually turned down an opportunity to go to Harvard because at the time, and still is true, Brown University really has, uh, it's recognized as having the best, uh, one of if not the best neuroscience programs in the country. Yeah. Like just for example, uh, researchers at Brown in the last few years uh, identified and discovered a new type of receptor in the eye. You've been taught about rods and cones if you remember back in you know, sure. your medical Everyone knows about rods and cones, but there's a third type of photoreceptor in the eye that we just didn't even know, and researchers at Brown discovered that. So there's a lot of great research that was there, and I basically went to Brown because of the neuro program, and I wanted to become the, the next great, greatest sort of neuroscientist. That was that I was could my totally thing. see you doing that too, just like in a lab coat and <laughs> yeah, I, I, I you know, like looking looking like you here. But what I realized is coming from a, you know, being a, a big fish in a small pond, being, you know, tops in my high school, um, you know, all these accolades to go in a place like Brown where it's like, um, and I won't swear because I don't want to disrespect, but it's like, crap, um, I ain't as smart as I thought I was. Um, and it came to light when I had a roommate um, who's one of the most brilliant people that I know. His name is Dr. Charles Kasarjan, and he's actually a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic now. And we studied neuroscience together, and I realized working with him, I never, never would have the intellect of someone like him. He's one of the leading neurologists in the country today. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it was, I'm really glad that I had the, uh, you know, the privilege to be his roommate, to be one of his best friends, and to study with him, because were it not for someone like him, I never would have realized how easy what came difficult to me came to someone like that, and it made me realize that I just didn't have the intellectual tools to do that. I'm much more equipped to operate in more of the quote-unquote real world. You know, uh, Charles is someone who would read a, an organic chemistry book, and he would remember almost photographically everything that he studied. I was the guy that had to study for hours. I, right. I got to where I was through hard work. Yeah. He got to where he was with hard work plus tremendous intellect. And so going through that experience, I realized I'm not going to be that person. And even though I pursued the neuroscience thing, I realized I was never going to be the world's greatest neurosurgeon. We're operating at the Mayo Clinic like 
uh, like Dr. Charles is now. So it made me realize that that wasn't the path for me, but maybe business offers an opportunity to combine that interest in brain science and in, in psychology, but applied in more of a, a real world setting. When did you change course then from the neuroscience? I, after graduation, um, I really decided, I said, I'm going to take some time off. And I didn't go to medical school. I didn't pursue a pursu uh, PhD in neuroscience. Um, but I thought about it. And basically what I said is, I'm going to work on Wall Street for a couple years uh, for a couple of reasons. So the honest answer is I could make more money doing that than almost anything else. There's almost and nothing. have less debt. <laughs> and less debt. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I actually uh, side story, but it's 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 a good it's a good story. So yeah. I grew up poor. I like side um, stories. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I, I grew up a little bit poor, but when I was in I think fifth grade, um, my my grandparents passed away. My m huh. mother's parents passed away, and they didn't have any money, but they they gave uh, five thousand dollars to my sister and me. Uh, that was like my inheritance was five thousand dollars. And I basically could have done whatever the hell I wanted with that money. Could have bought a dirt bike, could have spent it on video games, um, whatever. I decided I wanted to teach myself how to invest in the stock market. Now, I'd love to give myself credit for what I'm about to tell you, but in honesty, it's, it's all about dumb luck because I grew up in the, uh, in the, in the 90s when the tech, you know, the tech boom was basically happening. But long story short, I took that $5,000 and translated it into just under $100,000. Wow. College education, um, and basically sold everything um, uh, right at the height of the bubble, 99, 2000, right at the height of the bubble. I mean, it was literally, I could not have been born at a better time. It was dumb, it, like idiotic luck is what it came down to. But I still made some smart investment decisions. One of my most successful investments was a company by the name of Applied Materials, which does semiconductor work. They supply the precursor to what Intel was putting into computers. So yeah. I recognized, you know, even as a kid, where the opportunities Pretty were. Pretty smart. Wow. So, so I invested in this money and became really addicted to making money in the stock market. And I said, I want to do this for a living. I want to trade. I want to work on Wall Street and, and pursue that. And at the same time, I was really interested in sort of consumer psychology, the, the whole, you know, the boom and bust mentality, the cyclical, the cycl you know, this isn't even a word, but, you know, the, the cyclicalness or cycl cyclicality of markets and understanding how psychology drove that, this greed and fear. And so I, it was sort of the way I justified it to myself was this was a way to apply neuroscience science in a business setting and at the same time buy me a little bit of time to figure out what the hell do I want to do with my life? Do right. I want to you know, go into medicine or do I really just want to pursue business? Yeah. Long story short, I fell in love with that. Uh, found a way to combine what I was doing um, with the opportunity to go to China. I worked for a company called AIG. Um, worked for AIG until 2008 and the reason why I left the corporate world to do what we do now is my nights and weekends I was studying direct response marketing. I had, you know, came across Glenn Livingston's work and I woke up one day at the, and I can't remember when this was exactly in 2008 and you, you might remember this, uh, to a Wall Street Journal, Journal Asia edition on my desk that basically said, AIG to declare for bankruptcy. Right, yeah. And I said, oh crap, I'm going to be out of a job. And we all looked at each other in the office that day, and we all thought the same thing. Like, that's it. We're going to be laid off. What's going to happen? Everybody else walked around with this fear mentality, but I said, you know what? Screw it. This is an opportunity. This is a good time to leave. My wife was pursuing a PhD at the time at Hong Kong University. We, she had no money. She was making a $500 a month stipend wow. as a PhD researcher, plus her housing was covered. I called her up, and this was months in the making, but I said, honey, I think I'm going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave my you know, almost $300,000 a year job. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to – like we, we can do it. I don't know how we're going to make it work, but I sold everything that I owned except for a suitcase. I moved in with my wife in this 400-square-foot apartment in Hong Kong. And I built a multi-million dollar business off a $450 laptop. And wow. really, that was it. A $450 laptop, an internet connection, and the gray matter between my ears, just figuring out this stuff along the way. So anybody can do it. You know, there was a time where I didn't have the money, where I didn't have the expertise. Anybody can do it. And it's really about taking those past experiences, in my opinion, and leveraging that as much as you can. And for everybody, that's going to be a different journey, a different set of experiences. So where did you start, Ryan? Once you decided in your mind, okay, I'm just going to do it on my own, what did you do? So uh, it was, a bl again, it's, a, it's, it's constantly a lemonade out of lemon situation. So I'll tell you a story that got us there. Yeah. So when I was working for AIG in China, I was based in Shanghai. 
and my wife was in Hong Kong pursuing this PhD, so we're living this crazy bi-country marriage. And I was seeing my wife basically every two weeks. I, I had a lot of business trips. I was flying around the country opening up sales offices around China for AIG. And so every couple of weeks I would fly to southern China to Shenzhen and I would cross the border, go to Hong Kong for a long weekend and then fly back to Shanghai. So we did that. But in between then, I would basically go home to either a hotel or an empty apartment, just me. I had all this time on my hands, nights and weekends. I really wasn't into, I'm not a super social guy outside of like the business environment. So I wasn't like looking to go out and meet friends and make a whole bunch of friends. So I'd come home with all this time on my hands and because I had quietly heard about friends who were quote unquote making money on the internet, basically selling eBooks, I started pursuing figuring out how are these guys doing it? At the time I was getting burnt out about, you know, going from hotel to hotel, living on an airplane. Sounds tough. Yeah. You're away from your wife. Away from my wife. This is crazy. I mean, I was making good money, but I'm like, I can't do this. And I had always had this dream that I wanted to go into business for myself at some point. And, uh, and so I started studying direct response marketing. And I don't know exactly how I came across it, but one of the most influential first pieces of uh, resources that I came across were the Gary Halbert letters. And Gary Halbert, more than anybody else, I didn't know Gary personally. I only started studying his stuff after he passed away in 2003. But more than anybody else is responsible for transforming me into a writer who wrote in a very academic, you know, Ivy League style of writing to writing in a very colloquial media use style. And I did what Gary recommended with his letters. I read his letters. Every single night I would read a new letter and I have these composition notebooks that I still own to this day where I wrote out his letters by hand to internalize his style of writing. And it taught me to communicate in this different way. Gary was the first influence. From Gary, somehow I became introduced to Dr. Glenn Livingston. And Glenn was the first person online that I believed what he was teaching. Everybody else that was teaching people how to make money online, I, I just didn't believe them. I thought that they were you know, hucksters, that they were trying to you know, swindle people. I just didn't believe it. But Glenn was the first person that I believed in his system. So I invested more money than I'd ever invested in anything in the past. And like I said, I invested in his $2,000 training program, had it shipped to China. The thing was beat to hell. went through the whole thing, and I set it aside because I said this isn't going to work. I literally set it aside. Why? Said, Why did you think it was not going to work? Well, you know, you, 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 you lose confidence in yourself. You don't have this voice saying, you can do it, you can do it. You look at something, and, and it's natural for us to, you know, our, that voice in our head to say, you can't do this. You come up with a million reasons why something isn't going to work. Right. So I did that. And the thing that put me over the hump was when I said, you know what? And at this time, by the way, Jeremy, I, all I knew for myself was that I didn't want to be a corporate guy forever. I wanted to launch my own business. And I had no idea what the hell I was going to do. And I went from everything from uh, investing all my money into a McDonald's franchise. I went to thinking about starting an import-export company in China. I mean, every yeah. possible I like thing. hearing your thought process on this and what you went through. Yeah. I mean, it went through yeah. everything. And everything was like, no, and I'm, and I'm not a risk taker. I didn't want to spend all this money. I did not, and I wanted to bootstrap my business. That was one thing that was important to me. I did not want to borrow outside money that I would have to pay back. That mm-hmm. created too much anxiety and too much pressure in my mind. So then I, basically the thing that, that solved it for me was this. I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to go get an MBA. But if I were to go to an, get an MBA from a top school, I'm going to be spending at least 50 grand a year. I'm going to be spending $100,000 on my education. Right. So what if I took a fraction of that money and invested it in tuition? I said, who cares if my first business succeeds or not? I'm just going to invest this money in the learning mm-hmm. process. Just go through the process of creating mm-hmm. a WordPress blog doing the market research, writing a sales letter, building a product, all of these things. If I just take that money and invest it in, treat it as tuition, yeah. and just see what happens. That was the key that unlocked it for yeah. me. I took that business, that first business using Glenn's method in a gardening niche, a niche market. I took that business and went from nothing to $25,000 a month in 18 months, oh. and I have it back. I replicated the process in two other niches, all using what became my survey funnel method, which is something I now teach, and then I started attending masterminds for people who said, hey, Ryan, what you've done is, is brilliant. Uh, and at the time, my goal, Jeremy, by the way, is I wanted my, my big thing was I'm going to go into 20 of these markets. If I can do 10 markets at half a million dollars a piece, I've got a, 10, I've got a $5 million a year business. If I can do 20, I've got a $10 million a year business. That was my strategy. And I said, I've knocked out three of these. What if I could just knock out 20? Then along the way, I started talking to people about what I was doing, and I attended masterminds, paid masterminds, where you know, I was just a you know, guy forking all over, over all this money. And there was one mastermind in particular where uh, more than one person approached me and basically said, Ryan, what you've done is brilliant, 
how much would it cost if I just handed you this big pile of money to just for me in my business? Right. And that first you know, proposition, again, I said, no, I don't want to do this. This is the business that I'm pursuing. But it made me think and rethink my business model. And this is really what I've done the last five, six years is, is do this in market after market. And it's, been, it's a result of everything that I just described. So I know that was like a long answer no. to a very short question. But I think it's important to, for people to understand you don't yeah. get here by like everything was premeditated and exactly scripted. Right. There's a lot of twists and turns, dead ends changes of decision. And if we have this interview in five years from now, I mean, who the hell knows what things are going to look like. But right now, that's right. what kind of led me to, to where we are today. Yeah, No, I like, I always like the long answers and I always like the side stories. So always, always add those in. Right, and, and Ryan, you, you mentioned a few things and obviously, you know, with the, the survey funnel formula, and I want to touch on a few things. First of all, just to tell people what the survey funnel formula is. And I think you have an interesting way of structuring payment from your clients. So I don't know which one would make sense to, to talk about first. Cause you mentioned someone wanted to hand you a pile of cash and you, you, I don't know from the beginning, if you structured the payment the same way as you do now. Sure. So why don't we introduce what the survey funnel formula is so okay. we can kind of get a sense for what's involved in that yeah. and then um, we can talk about sort of the I just want to keep people in the dark of what it is until the end. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good strategy. Go like, I, I learned that from Andre you know Chaperone. Sounds really cool. Yeah, Andre Chaperone. Tease it and then just don't say it until the end or maybe not even this one, but in the next interview five years from now, so let's watch. Exactly. But, but, <laughs> Dude, for the next, uh, the next episode of Fired Insider in five years. Right. So it is. Um, yeah, so what's the survey funnel formula? So let's talk more basic than that. So survey funnel formula is a specific sales funnel model that I've developed and that I build in market after market. So a sales funnel, for someone who's wondering what exactly does that mean, or so at least we can have a conversation and that we're on the same page yeah. on it. A sales funnel, the way I describe it, is a set of premeditated, predetermined steps that you want someone to take that takes them from going from not knowing who you are at all to becoming a paid customer. Right. In many cases, in most cases, that is more than one single step. There's a series of baby steps that you need someone to take. It's sort of like courting a woman for the first time, right? It's you good don't analogy. Just, yeah. yeah, you don't just ask someone to uh, marry you the first time you meet them. It starts with maybe a hello and then a handshake. Handshake leads to a hug, hug leads to a kiss, kiss leads to a second date, etc. There's a series of steps that you want someone to take. So generally speaking, that's what I describe as a sales funnel. So we can kind of be on the same page there. Right. A survey funnel is a specific sales funnel model that I use that uses surveys in a slightly unusual way. So I'm going to describe what that looks like to kind of give people a vision of what it looks like online. So typically, if you can just close your eyes and imagine landing on a website for the first time, typically what is very common online is you see something like, check out our free report which reveals 17 different ways to grow your business, enter your name and email here. Okay, That's a typical squeeze page or landing page environment, a typical introduction that someone might make to get you into their business. What I do is a little bit different. So my approach philosophically is as follows. I want you to imagine for a moment landing on a website. On that website is a video. Below that video is a button. The video basically says a variation on what I'm about to tell you. It says this. Listen, my name is Ryan, and I've helped, in, in this fictitious example, I've been helping people grow their business for the last 25 years. And what I've realized in that time is that different people are in different situations. And before I can point you, it, before I can determine whether or not I can help you solve whatever challenge it is that you're looking to solve, I first need to learn a little bit more about your business. So if you take a few moments to tell me a little bit about who you are, what you're struggling with, I can put you in touch with the best match resource for what it is that you're looking to achieve. And mm. the way you need to do that is as follows. Below this video, click on the button that you see. A window will pop up. Answer the simple questions that you see that pop up. And with that information, I'll not only tell you whether or not I can help you, but I'll also put you in touch with the best match resource for you. Yeah. Philosophically, that's what I do. I gave you yeah. the plain vanilla version of what it is that I do. Now, sure. what I do with that survey is I take that information to customize the marketing that they get. 
So instead of sending someone to one video sales letter after taking that survey, I might send people to one of seven video sales letters that's customized based on the results of the survey. I'll, then use, I'll also use the results of the survey to customize the email marketing that someone might get from me. So a very basic example might be if I ask someone, are you a man or a woman, which would be a relevant question in a market like weight loss, I'll customize the email follow-ups to say, for example, Jeremy, in your case, you would select a man. So the emails that you would get from me might say something like this. Now, if you're a man and you've struggled to, you know, with weight gain, then there's a unique thing that happens that's specific to men. Versus if you're a woman, that same email would say, now if you're a woman who struggled to lose weight, there's a specific thing that goes on with women, which is why you might be struggling. Now I gave you the most plain vanilla version of For it. Sure. What I'm doing here is I'm custom customizing the marketing in all these different levels, customizing the products that I'm sell selling based on the results of the survey. Now, what we don't have time to get into in this call, which is something that I teach, is that the secret is that you're not positioning this as a survey. Customers going through this, they don't think they're even taking a survey. It's all positioned around someone's self-interest, where they are learning about something about themselves. It uses the same principles as to why personality tests and the strengths finder tests to take the conversation full circle are so compelling. Who is the, what's the most interesting subject to anybody? It's you. Right. We're more interested in ourselves than anybody else and anything else and anything that illuminates more about a person where you can tell something about who they are and uncover insights is going to be something that's going to be an attractive proposition for people. So that is the, at the 30,000 foot view, what I do all day, every day. There's more to it than that, but that mm. kind of gives you a sense. So to answer your question, second question around, well, what's my business model? Well, basically uh, I work- Before the business model, go back to the, the survey funnel for a second. What's a common mistake people make that you find when their clients first come to you? Perfect. Great question. So what I describe right there, the survey, so I use multiple surveys in my marketing and, and there are four specifically that come to mind, which are things that I, that I, that I teach people about and tell people about, people about this survey that we talked about right there is the second survey out of four. It's something I describe as my micro commitment bucket survey. And the reason why I describe it is that is it does two things. Number one, instead of getting people to enter their name and email straight away, this gets, this is going to get into a little bit of neuroscience, but I think it's, it's interesting. Instead of asking for people to enter their name and email right away, which is a threatening step, which basically sets off the flight or flight, fight or flight response mechanism yeah. in your brain, by asking people a series of multiple choice, micro commitment, baby step questions, you can fly under the radar. It's threatening to say, hey, Jeremy, what's your name and email? Because I want to send you some stuff. That's threatening. Right. Because at a subconscious level, you're thinking, is this guy going to spam me? Is he going to sell my contact information? If he knows my name, can he look me up online? Can he, come, can he find out where I live? Can he come to my house? Can he rob me? All these things are happening at a very subconscious level, so it's threatening. But before we do that, if we take a baby step and say, before we get started, can you tell me, are you a man or a woman? And the reason why I ask that question, say it's a weight loss uh, market, is because men and women struggle with different weight loss challenges. You're going to say, I'm a man. It's less threatening than asking for your you know, your name, your email, your social right. security number, your address. <laughs> so that's the reason for that survey. Now, to answer your question directly, what's one of the mistakes that people make is assuming what those questions should be and assuming yeah. what the answers to those questions should be. Before you ask someone a set of multiple choice questions, you need to make sure that you're sending people into the right possibilities. So before you even think about doing this micro-commitment bucket survey, you actually have to go through a process that I describe as my deep dive research survey. This is a survey that comes before that survey. It's a one-time survey that you do whenever you're launching a new marketing funnel, a new product, op getting into a new market, where you ask a series of open-ended questions, which you use to figure out what the A, B, C, D is going to be on the close-ended questions. Mm -hmm. Because when you start with a multiple choice question, which is a mistake that people make, it's based on the sphere of your knowledge. Your assumptions, yeah. Your assumptions. It's based on what you think the possibilities that someone might answer. So to get around that, the solution is you ask this open-ended question to figure out what that A, B, C, D should be. And there's a lot of methodology. There's a process that goes into it that obviously we won't have time to go into in more detail. Right. But it, it sets the stage for the mistake that people make, which is assuming 
what those buckets might be. Yeah, what's this, What's a question that you remember thinking there's no way I would have ever thought of this question unless I did this research? Well, let me give you, uh, that's a good question. Let me, let me think about that. There's one that comes to mind around, okay, so one of the markets that I operate in is the tennis niche. One of the, mar- one of the funnels that we have in the tennis niche is a funnel that helps people improve their serve speed. So basically we say we, the, the hook, without getting into the specific, specifics of it, is that everybody tends to make uh, one of seven major mistakes in their uh, tennis serve. And once you identify what your number one mistake is, you can usually unlock 10 to 15 miles an hour to your serve speed, which makes a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the premise of this funnel. Well, when we went down this path, the partner that I work with is a seasoned tennis pro. We actually work with uh, uh, the, the spokes, the, the person that we work with is the talent that we work with was a former number one ranked player in the world. It's a, if you follow tennis, one of the most famous tennis players in history. Okay? I'll just yeah. say that without... Uh, I've uh, met this person at an at a event before too, so I know who you're perfect. talking about. Yeah, but yeah. So you can see this person yes. and you, you, you might know the talent that we work with. So he's a yeah. former, former Olympian, number one ranked player in the world, winner of the US Open, Australian Open, and a whole bunch of other tournaments. So he's a, a tennis player that everybody, if I said the name, would recognize. Right. Anyways, we thought we knew the mistakes that people made in their serve. Like we went through the litany of, you know, the 50 years of coaching experience that the pro has had along with my client who's also a professional tennis coach have had. We kind of knew what those things were. Mm. But I said, listen, you cannot assume. We cannot assume. I know Mm. there's a tendency to think that we know our market, Mm. but just trust me on this. Go through. And what we found was that there was this bucket where roughly 21% of the market was having this one particular issue. It was not even going to be on the list of our A, B, C, D, E, F. It wasn't even going to be on the list. But because we did that deep dive survey, we found that there was this mistake that people were making, and we said, holy crap. Not only do we need to ask that question or offer that solution, offer that answer in our multiple choice question, we also need to create a targeted VSL, video sales letter, that addresses that specific concern. Right. So it's this, you know, it, it, I see it time and time again. That's just one that comes to mind now. Yeah. It, I've literally never done a funnel implementation where we have not identified a, uh, an assumption that we thought we knew the market, right. but we were wrong about. Yeah, I wanted to ask that because I think that is important. We all just assume, yes, we know. We've been doing this for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and I already know what the problem is. But you, the, even if it's just the verbiage, um, it's going to be different from what they're saying. Um, what is one thing? I know the research is very extensive. What's one thing someone should you know, start doing to do that research? Do you just suggest they just start calling certain you know, people that they know? Or what, where should they start with that? Great question. So um, in the most basic sense, if you have an existing audience that you can leverage, so you have an email list, you have a Facebook fan following, you have some sort of audience that you can communicate with, you have a leg up. So I'm going to assume that situation for a moment. Sure. You want to ask people, and this is one of the mistakes that people make, you want to ask people, you want to think about what is it that you're thinking about creating? Maybe it's a new product, getting into a new, new market, maybe it's launching a new project. The mistake that people make, and it's something that I talk about in my training, is that you cannot ask people what they want. You cannot overtly say, hey, what should I create? What do you want? Right. People don't know what they want. And I'll give you two examples as to where this ring is true. So there's a famous quote that people often uh, bring up whenever I start talking about surveys. It's a Henry Ford quote. Right. And basically it's the quote where Henry Ford says, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. Right. And the reason why that quote rings true for so many people is because it is true. If you ask people what they want, they're not going to give you an accurate answer. People are only good at giving you two types of information. And anyone listening to this, these are things that you want to write down. Yeah, for sure. Two types of information. The first type of information is past behavior. The second type of information is what people don't want, don't like. And I'll illustrate this with an example. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're, you know, like us, we're hanging around at the bar, we're in the room with a bunch of different people, and at some point someone says, hey, you guys getting hungry? You want to grab some dinner? And everyone's kind of like, yeah, let's get some dinner. What's the next question? Where should we go? You feel like. Yeah. What happens next? I don't know. What do you feel like? People don't know what they want. But if you frame it a different way and you say, okay, well, let's narrow it down. What is it that you don't want? People will start giving you useful answers. People mm-hmm. will say, I don't want to do sushi. I did sushi last night. I don't want to do pizza because I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm eating gluten free. You'll get a litany of responses of what people right. don't like, what they don't want. Similarly, if you went around that room and you say, okay, well, what did you have for dinner last night? 
unless you're being a smart ass or unless you have you know, retrograde amnesia, you're going to be able to answer, answer that question extremely accurately. You're going to remember what you had for dinner last night, right? So people are good at only answering two types of behavior, uh, two types of uh, information, past behavior and what yeah. they don't like. Yeah. So translate that back to the survey. You cannot ask people what they want. You have to ask people, what is the single biggest challenge that you're having with X? Or what is the thing that you, don't, that you can't stand about your current fill-in-the-blank? So when I was breaking into the memory market, one of my niche markets that I'm in, it's a six-figure business, is a business called Rocket Memory, where we teach people how to improve their memory. Yeah. It leverages my background in yeah. neuroscience. And the picture on that page is brilliant, by the way. It's you with glasses, uh, yeah. the chalkboard behind it is like the quadratic formula or something on there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I trust this guy. But anyways. <laughs> But when I was going into that market, yeah. I thought I knew that market inside and out because in college I actually taught memory improvement techniques. I taught neuroscience, a two, taught a section of Neuro 101 for two years. So I, I thought I knew what people wanted with respect to that market. But what I did is, and I realized this from an earlier mistake that I'd made in another market, that you can't assume that. And so I asked people that question. When it comes to improving your memory, what's the single biggest challenge that you're struggling with right now? And there's more to it than that, but if you do nothing else but ask that right. one question and you listen and read those responses, it's tremendous. It's amazing the type of feedback that you're going to get from your market. Yeah, yeah. Right. So about the client charges, yeah. what's interesting about what you do is even you say on your website, I do not hide charges. You know, they're, they're right there. Anyone could read it. They don't have to email you. Tell me some of the psychology behind that why, and how you structure it, decide to structure it that way. Well, that's a good point. So to answer that question specifically, the reason why I put my prices, um, I make them public, is uh, I can't have people wasting my time. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this on this call, if it was a previous interview that I did, so forgive me, but I basically have a, a you know, client wait list that stretches into, into next year, um, and it, basically a year in advance. And they're, if, put it this way, if my rates were half what they were, I would have a, a wait list that extended into the next 10 years. Um, because once you start having success and once you start having proven results, I'm, I, put it this way, I'm a marketing guy that does no marketing. And which is funny, I don't even really have a marketing website per se. All my business comes through word of mouth referrals. And the reason why is because my clients get such good results. And you probably noticed it from the events. And you know, one of my clients probably whispered into your ear. Right. Uh, once you get results for your clients like that, they're actually happy to, to share it with other people as long as they're not in a competing niche. Right. So I've never had to do any marketing at all. All my business comes to me through referrals and through word of mouth. So I, I don't have to do any marketing. So I actually want to repel people. I want people to see this is what it costs. And knowing that, if you're still interested after knowing that, let's have a conversation. But I don't want to go down this path of people saying, yes, I want to work with you. I've heard amazing things about what you do. And then we go down this path, we do the dance, and then they find out, oh, you know, your rates are really expensive. It also sets the tone where it's basically like, this is it, take it or leave it. Um, you know, there's no negotiation. It's, this is the rate. And if you want to work together, those are the terms. And if not, I've got other programs that would be a fit to get access to me and my expertise mm -hmm. that are short of working together one-on-one, -on -one, which kind of might be a good um, uh, way to talk about the fee structures and not from a, a self-promotional perspective, but how other people can think about how they might structure their fee structures in, the, in their business. Yeah. So, you know, I, I basically, I've got three different main levels that someone can work with me on. One is the high level, one-on-one -on -one consulting, done for you implementation, which is at a very high price point. So a done for you funnel for me on the front end approach, approaches fifty dollars to $100,000 at the time of this interview. Six months from now, that number will actually be higher um, because of the demand for working with me. So there's an upfront fee plus a royalty on gross sales, which ranges anywhere from five to 10 10% generally speaking. So there's a large upfront fee that proves a commitment. Plus there's also a, an ongoing perpetual royalty. Now the reason for that is because it takes a lot of time to do what I do and to do it well. And so that's at the very highest level. Yeah. And I'm at a point now where unless a business is really doing about half a million to a million dollars a month in revenue that we can do together, it doesn't make sense for uh, us to work together. So that's right. at the most highest level. Yeah. At the same time, I'm not this elitist that feels like only the highest levels of business should have access to this methodology. I actually teach, I have an information 
course training that teaches people my methodology and a mastermind on the tail end of it where people can get access to my ongoing teaching. They get access to the software. I have proprietary software that I use to build these funnels, to do the survey. I make that extremely affordable. It's only a few hundred dollars a, m- a few hundred dollars to get access to the training. My ongoing mastermind is only $200 a month. We have about uh, approaching 500 people in that mastermind as we speak. And that doesn't give you personal access to me. It doesn't give you one-on-one access to me, but it gives you access to the methodology, to the training. And then in the middle... And then if you want to mention where people could check that out, if it's relevant for both of those, where can people check that out? Yeah, sure. So um, you can learn more about my training course at surveyfunnelformula.com. If you go to that page right now at the time of this interview, it's all that, all that you're going to see there is a little form that says the training is not currently available, but enter your name and email to be notified the next time it is made available. And I won't get into it here unless we think it's relevant, but I only make the training available periodically. I don't make it available forever. I only sort of let a certain number of people get access to my methodology. I do that for a couple of reasons. I like to monitor who's using my methodology, my technology. At the same time, my business is a boutique business. I'm not in a position where I can work with 100,000 customers at any one time. Mm. So I throttle the number of people who mm. we can work with to make sure that we take care of the customers who do come into our world. So there's that training that's available at that level. And then in between, which fills that gaping void between $100,000 and 10% royalty if mm. you're doing a million dollars a month and startup operation is my coaching program. So my coaching program is a group coaching program which gives you some direct access to Ryan, but more importantly, gives you access to my team. Every single week, you get access to my copywriter who writes my copy, to my technical team who builds out the technical funnels uh, to get copy reviews, to get technical questions answered, get access to the training which teaches you how to do this in a more deep dive way, implementation workshops. It also gives you access to my live event that I mentioned where I three times a year bring a group of people in person in Austin, and we go through live your existing funnels, and you get that experience where you can benefit from what's going on in all these different niches and different markets. And so that's closer to a $2,000 a month price point, much more affordable than the, what's become now a fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month minimum threshold to work with me in a private client environment, which is just inaccessible for most businesses. So what I try to do is have options in this inch-wide, mile-deep space that cater to all levels of the market. The ultra-high end that I work with one-on-one, the sort of beginning entrepreneurs that might be at the six-figure level or maybe they're not quite there, and the businesses that are at the high six, maybe you know, low seven-figure level that want access to my team and my expertise but aren't quite in a position where they can afford to hire me to work one-on-one. And again, it's all focused on this inch-wide, mile-deep space where we can be the best in the world at what it is with, that we do. And so I don't go through that model as a sort of a boastful um, self-promotional thing, although I do hope that some people will be interested in working with me in some capacity. I do it primarily from the standpoint of think about how you structure your business. Mm. Think about what inch-wide, mile-deep space you can be the best in the world at, and think about how you can have a product offering that caters to all segments of that market. Yeah. So, Ryan, can you talk about a campaign that did really well and why it was effective, and then one that didn't do well. Because it sounds like up to this point, it's like, well, everything I do does well. So it's it, <laughs> everything works. You were that simple. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, let, me, let, me talk about a, a, uh, let me talk about a few failures, because I think the failures are more in- instructional sure. than the success. So uh, for one of my first failures was um, uh, going into a niche market. It was one of the first markets that I went into. It's in a gardening market. Um, I can't reveal the specifics of the exact business because I have a partner in the business and part of our agreement, I'm, I'm not able to explicitly, I can't yeah, say, here's the your Whatever you can share. Just yeah. instructional. Sure. So we went into this market and I did my deep dive research process where I researched the market and I figured out what is it that people want. And what was interesting going through this process is that I got an overwhelming number of people who wanted help with one very specific question. And we were using this deep dive survey to design the information product that we were creating. We were creating a book and we were also using it to design the marketing. Well, you want to know the number one thing that, wanted, that people wanted to know in this market? It was all around watering. How often should I water my plant? When should I water my plant? How much water should I give it? All these questions around watering. So what we did is we created this watering guide around the specific... Makes perfect uh, sense, yeah. Right? Sold almost nothing. Crickets. I couldn't understand what was going on. I said, what the hell did we do wrong? We listened to the market. We did the survey. We followed what they said. 
but here is the critical flaw that I made. FAQs, frequently asked questions, are often frequently, frequently answered questions. Questions that people on the front page of Google can do a search and get the answer to. And what I made the mistake of doing was focusing on frequency of response instead of depth of response. So what you'll find whenever you go through this process, and this is very instructional, is that when you do your Say that one more time. That's, that's pretty uh, profound. So, so the mistake I made, and I learned from this, and I've never made this mistake again, fortunately, is I focused on frequency of response rather than depth of response. Yeah. So if I looked at that survey, and if we were to pull it up right now, 80% of people who did that survey answered questions around watering, but their answers were shallow. What's the single biggest challenge that you're having right now with this particular, growing this particular plant? How should I water it? When do I water it? Watering. What kind of water do I give? When do I water? Short answers. Instead, I focused on the people who offered depth of response, which is what I did when I went back and looked at that survey. These are people who answered things around, I've had 10 of these plants in, my, uh, in the last five years. And every time I go to repot one of these plants, they die. And I've tried everything. I've tried this resource and that resource, and I've tried putting these type of pots and these type of pots, but everything that I've tried, I've killed my plant every single time. What should I do? So those responses, that repotting question as, as an exemplary yeah. example, came with much less frequency. You had to search for them. But the consistent trend was that every single one of them offered these deep, passionate responses. And I've learned to evolve my methodology now where I have all these different indicators that I look for that are indicators of what I call passion indicators. Passion indicators of how passionate a person's response is. So here's the counterintuitive thing. And this goes back to 80-20 stuff that we were talking about before. Right. If you ignore that 80%, ignore the 80% of shallow answers, even though that's the bulk of the market, those aren't people that are giving you indication that they're going to spend money for a solution. And you just focus on that 20%. You just focus on the 20% of people who offer you the most passionate, the mm -hmm. deepest responses, and you build your entire marketing process and your entire product mix catering to those people. One of the things we talked about at the, at the event was catering to heavy users. This is exactly what you're doing. You're catering to hyper-responsive customers, to heavy users, to passionate response takers. That's the segment of the market that you want to focus on. So I went back and instead, we redesigned our marketing around that segment of the, of the market and we hit pay dirt. It's counterintuitive. You ignore the 80%. You only focus on this tiny little group, this 20%. Are they, is there really more opportunity there than the rest of the 80%? The answer is yes. Read 80-20. Read Richard, Richard uh, Coach's book. Read Perry Marshall's book. You'll find example after example that that's where the opportunity is. So that was mm -hmm. one mistake that I made, and that's the learning experience that I had from it. Another mistake is, is pretty interesting, which is I decided to, uh, as crazy as it sounds, this business still exists today, and you can, go on and look at, you can go online and look at this website. For whatever reason, I decided that I was going to uh, get some leverage in my business. This is a few years ago now. But instead of going into market after market, where I had to recreate my marketing funnel time and time again, by, create, by focusing on one offline vertical, where I can build my marketing funnel once for one business in one geographic area, and doing it over and over and over again. Now, this business model is still actually very sound, and I'm doing this right now in other markets. One of them is, uh, is the dentistry market, and I'll soon be getting into your space, the chiropractic market. But the first market that I did this in was the pest control market. Now, I went into this market, and if you go to Pest Control Marketing Systems, you'll actually see my website today. I actually went into that market because I did my research, and I thought, this is brilliant. And uh, I'm smiling, by the way, Ryan, because we just – had someone come over from a pest control uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, so anyway, we had bees. That's why I asked all of the beekeeper and the pest control. Anyways. Yeah, exactly. so I went, and that's one of the things that led me. I went into this market thing. This is brilliant. Every city around the country, there are pest control operators that compete for business. In my city of Austin, Texas, you could go in the yellow pages right now, and there are about 25, 30 companies that you can go. So I thought, this is brilliant. I'm going to have a market in every single city that I offer. I'm going to do an area-exclusive deal where I'm going to license my funnel. I create this funnel once, and all I need to do is swap out someone's logo and the headline, and I'm done. And I'm going to sell this thing for $500, $1,000 a month under the premise that if they could just get a few more customers every single month, it's going to be brilliant. Here's the one mistake that I made. These mark, this market, the pest control market, these aren't people that spend that kind of money on marketing. These are people that look at a $200 or $100 a month marketing expense 
and they're trying to slice that down to 80 bucks because they don't see the value in this. And part of it is the fact that their margins aren't very good. Part of it is the fact of the business dynamic. That market in particular is dominated by a few high, big whales at yes. the top of the market and a ton of independent operators. These are guys that they are business owners, but they're the ones that are going out and they're spraying the pest control themselves. Right. I mean, a, t a massive miscalculation in the market that I wanted to go into. And this yeah. goes into the lesson that market selection more than anything else is really the biggest indicator of success. I completely missed the boat on selecting the market. So the model yeah. was right, but the market was wrong. And so again, one of the mistakes that I made was that I assumed that people would spend $500 to $1,000 a month to get access to this, when in reality, they weren't spending a fraction of that. And these are people, as, as crazy as it's going to sound, they didn't want more business because they were the ones applying the, the, doing the work themselves. If I would have doubled their business over, overnight, they would have had a heart attack because they didn't even have to, to, to offer the fulfillment on it. I would, have I would have crippled their business by doing that. Massive mis miscalculation. And the marketing that I built works tremendously. I get leads in that business every single day, people who reach out to me saying, hey, I want to work with you. But as soon as they hear the price points, they say, oh, I'm thinking maybe like 50 bucks a month. I mean, I spend 50 bucks a month on uh, you know, a, little P a little WordPress plugin or something like that in my business. So it's a huge mismatch. So those were two you know, uh, critical mistakes that I made in my business. And you don't, you don't even want to know how much money I spent pursuing that market. It wasn't six figures, but it was just short of six figures. Wow. And that's funny that I flushed down the toilet. Now, lemons out of lemonade or lemonade out of lemon situation again, I hired some people to help me run that business. I've been able, those people were really good. One person in particular has become my go-to number one uh, chief of staff assistant because she ended up being a superstar. I hired her to work with me in that business. She was so good. I was able to slaughter in one of my other businesses and she's with me here today. I never would have hired her had I not been pursuing that business. So there's always yeah. opportunity that comes out of, there's a quote that someone, uh, and you might remember it better than me, that really stood out in my mind from Titans. And it was in every challenge, in every mistake, yes. There is opportunity that is so big, it eclipses the size of that problem right. by a magnitude of a thousand. Right. And so if you look at every challenge, every mistake that you make, that opportunity is a thousand times bigger. And so there are things that I did as a, as a result of that pest control business that have grown my business exponentially. It's a minor setback. You know, trust me, I don't want to be spending eighty, ninety thousand dollars on something and pursue it in the you know to flush that money down the toilet. But the lessons that I learned from that experience have helped me get to where I am today. So those yeah. are two mistakes yeah. that that really come to mind. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing that because sometimes it's not easy to share our mistakes or failures, but oftentimes we do learn sometimes the most out of those. So what about a big success that you could talk about and why it worked? Uh, Big success right now is really is really my model, um, and I can talk about um, you know maybe a, uh, a you know a, a two things. Number one, broadly speaking, to take the conversation from where we were before, it was it's it's focusing on this one thing at the exclusion of everything else. And I use this expression: it's sort of like cutting off your toe to save the foot. And sometimes when you've got a lot of things going on in your business, and I'm Trust me, I'm guilty of this, just as guilty of this as the next guy. You've got a lot of different projects you've got going on, whether it's you're doing a podcast, you're writing a book, you've got all these different things. And sometimes what happens is uh, if you read The Pumpkin Principle, I think is the yeah, name. Yeah, great book. Yeah. yeah the Pumpkin it, Plan by, uh, yes. Um, yes. And it's by, um, it starts with an M, right? I can't think Matt, of it. Matt, um, I don't know. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, The Pumpkin Plan. It's a good book. Great yeah. book. Basically, the premise is if you want to, grow a world-class pumpkin, like these pumpkins that grow to 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, however big they get, 3,000 pounds, whatever it is, you have to cut the vines of all the other pumpkins. You're never going to grow that world-class pumpkin until you do that. And it goes down, it comes down to the Warren Buffett uh, adage where, you know, his whole philosophy is, you know, most people try to diversify, don't keep your eggs in one basket. His philosophy is keep your eggs in, all, in one basket and watch that basket really carefully. Right. That's what you're and for me, the, from a strategic perspective, it was a function of killing all these different things. I had a business that was called Your Content Everywhere. You can go online. You can still see that business. It was selling like crazy. Basically, it was a content delivery system for people who wanted to have their, their expertise everywhere. They wanted to be on YouTube. They wanted to be on iTunes. They wanted to be in all these different places but didn't have the time to do that. I built a system to do it. I was hiring up staff. And, I, and I, I grew that business to maybe, I don't know, 10, 20, or 20, 30 clients, something like that. And I killed the business. 
because I realized that it was a distraction from everything else. And if I wanted to grow that business, it was a failed model. I had to hire so much staff that it was a linear growth path. For every new five clients I hired, I had to hire more staff. And I was never going to have this like leverage point mm -hmm. where the existing staff could support you know, an exponential number of people. So it was painful to lose that revenue and to tell those clients, I'm sorry, I can't work with you anymore. But I had to cut off that toe to save the foot. So that's one example. So that strategically has been really important and it's allowed me to kind of own this positioning as the survey funnel guy and focus exclusively in this inch wide, mile deep space. So again, to just keep the, the theme specific, I would encourage anybody to look at your existing business and say, you know, to borrow Richard Coach's approach and say, what, you know, what is something that I can be number one or number two at the world at? And if I can't be number one or number two at the thing I'm doing right now, narrow my focus. So it's unlikely that I can be the number one sales funnel expert in the world, maybe even the number one online sales funnel expert, although I would, I would argue to say that I'm in the top echelon of those people. But it's probably unlikely that I'll be the number one player in that space. Mm -hmm. But I can own the survey funnel space, and I can be number one in that space. And that's an entree point into other things. If the survey funnel model ever uh, doesn't work as well as it's working now, it's a fantastic tool to shift your focus one degree or another, or broaden your focus from there. So I would say that's a big lesson that I've learned. It's an uncomfortable lesson to, again, cut that toe off to save the foot. Just like, as you know, imagine in real life, cutting off a toe is painful. It's a painful decision. <laughs> right. think about the implications of it. Yeah. You know, you'd rather be, you know, four toes and one foot rather than have a peg leg. So um, <laughs> uh, that's been kind of one of the biggest lessons and things that's working for me right now. Yeah. So, Brian, I want to ask you a question about copywriting. Okay. Okay. So what is a, a big tip that you tell people? Because you, again, when I ask about, you talk about landing page in the video, you'll just spout out just perfect copy that someone could probably write down and just do their whole video. What's a, a good copywriting tip that you can give people? Let's narrow that focus a little bit more. Do you want a spe specific linguistic pattern that I can share that might be uh, useful for people to use and I can explain the reason why it works so well? Or do you want to talk about learning copywriting and the path to becoming a better copywriter? Yeah, the path to becoming a better copywriter. What, it, let's say we could narrow it even more to a sales page. What should someone look at with their sales page, maybe just a headline that you have found valuable when you look at headlines or evaluate your headlines? So this is a, in Malcolm Gladwell's uh, context, and I hope people, um, I hope one theme that people pick up from this is that, Jeremy, I know you're a huge reader. I know you do audio books and you do all sorts of different modalities. Hopefully just the fact that you and I, how many books have we mentioned on this call? You know, we're huge readers. Right. And so I don't want to take credit for anything that's, uh, that, that really, that to, to make people think that I've come up with really any of this. This is really just assimilation of ideas, which is a function of, uh, uh, investing, uh, you know, time reading and assimilating and, and connecting all these different disparate ideas in a unique way. Mm -hmm. The reason why I bring that up is I'm about to reference another book. So in Malcolm Gladwell terminology, this is a 10,000 hour thing. So I've invested my 10,000 hours personally in copywriting. The reason why I made the decision to do that is copywriting is what I consider to be an evergreen skill. Mm -hmm. It's not like learning Facebook or Google AdWords or something that, you know, uh, uh, MySpace, which, mm -hmm. you know, now is almost obsolete completely. It's really a skill that's evergreen that you can learn now and you can apply it no matter what medium that you might be looking at. And that's the reason why I made the decision to invest in that skill, copywriting specifically. Mm -hmm. How did I do that? Well, it started with the Gary Halbert letters. It started with you know, learning, internalizing that style of writing, reading those letters, copying them out in longhand to learn that style of writing at a almost – uh, almost like a cellular level, and I'm not saying that in a woo, -woo way, but it's become it's it's reached a point that I can't have a conversation like we're having right now without writing, without speaking in the form of sales copy almost. So I tend to use phraseology like, now the reason why I do that, that's a copy thing. It's a reason why copy. I speak like that. Uh, so it's, it's affected me in a very deep way. So part of it is you got to put the time in. Okay, you got to put the time in. Study control pieces. Write those pieces out in longhand. I'm going to give another resource. I'm not going to be financially uh, uh, compensated for giving this resource, but there's a resource out there called copyhour.com. A gentleman by the name of Derek Johansson has assembled a whole bunch of these control sales letters, yeah. and he's built out a program where you, every day you get assignments 
to copy out proven sales letters and proven emails every single day so that you internalize the style of writing. Mm. Great program. Derek's a great guy. So there are resources out like that, like that, that you can follow. So you got to get your reps in. Yeah. The second thing is a piece of advice that Jerry Seinfeld offered when he was interviewed. And he said, Jerry, what? And then the interviewer said, Jerry, what's the secret to your success? What's the secret? How, you know, comedians out there are successful, but, you know, this is when he was at the peak of his game, top of his game, peak of his career, and he was the pinnacle of, of comedy. And, and someone said, the interviewer said, what is the secret to your success? He said two words, just write. You've got to get your reps in. More than anything else, you've got to get your reps in. If you look at a professional basketball player, and I don't know if you're a sports fan, Jerry, but you look sure. at a player like Ray Allen, you know, one of the best shooters in history, or Reggie Miller. These are Kobe Bryant, anybody like that who's a tremendous shooter. What do they do? They get their reps in. They get their 500 reps in every single day shooting these shots. These are the guys. These are how guys go from you know, 80%, 70%, 60% at the foul line to 92%. It doesn't happen by accident. Steve Nash, the same way. He gets his reps in. And with writing, it's the same thing. So I write a lot. I write on a lot of different mediums. I write, if you look at someone like Dan Kennedy, he's far more prolific than even I am. He writes how many books a year, how many sales letters, how many emails. Well, I try to approximate that as much as possible. Now, for me, I'll give you a hack. The thing that I've learned to do, because I don't have a lot of time to write, because I'm on the phone with clients every single day, I've learned to get, to get so uh, dialed in with my writing that I practice the art and skill of speaking copy verbatim. So in the last five years, the thousands of hours that I've spent on the phone with clients, clients come to expect me to be able to almost spit out, regurgitate, word perfect copy right, right out. And that expectation. No pressure. No pressure, yeah, right. exactly. But what's, what's, what that's allowed me to do, and I'll just give you a perfect example. I wrote an email this morning. I wrote an email this morning in six and a half minutes. You know, want to know how I know it took me six and a half minutes? Because here's how I write the, my emails now to my list. And then people are going to hear this and say, this is crazy, but it's true. I drop my son off at school, at Montessori school. He's two and a half years old. I drop him off at school. It takes me six and a half minutes to go from school back to my house. After I drop him off, I turn the iPhone on. I hit the record button on the recorder application on my iPhone. I put it on my dashboard. And as I'm driving, I read out virtually what's a, nearly a word-perfect email. I fire that recording over to my copywriter. He cleans it up a little bit, fixes the grammatical mistakes. He sends me an email. I look at it, maybe make one or two more tweaks, and the thing is done, out the door. It used to take me two, three hours to write an email because I'd right. obsess over language patterns. But so it's you got to get your reps in. Yeah. So you know, my biggest advice is write as much as you can. If you want to do the, the word perfect verbatim copy thing, get yourself in an environment where you're on stage. Every client call that I have is like a performance. And you have to when – when they expect – when a client expects you to come up with that, you rise to the occasion. So for me, for my personality type, for my strengths, for everything like that, that business model works well for me. It stretches me from a copywriting perspective and forces me to be on the top of my game. So that more than anything else has really helped me become the, you know, the copywriter that I've, that I've become. And I don't think I've reached the top of my game. I mean there are copywriters out there that are in a whole different league, but it's at least gotten to me, gotten me to, to the point that I've been able to, to get to um, and hopefully get to the next level. Yeah. Ryan, first of all, you're phenomenal. Second of all, thank you for your time. I have one last question for you, sure. but before I ask it, just tell people where they can find you. What are you working on lately? Point people to, to find out your, your great resources. Absolutely. So I want to point people to a free resource, um, if that's okay. Yeah, whatever, uh, whatever works. Go to uh, the funnel specialist, funnelspecialist.com or thefunnelspecialist.com. There I have a, uh, a free email that I send out every single day. It's my daily email where I talk about the funnels that I'm building and I share some of the lessons that I'm learning. I reveal some of the things that I'm doing in the client implementations. I share some of my coaching student successes so you can see what things are working now and how you can apply that in your business. And that's a 100% free resource. Now, I'm going to be honest. I'm not as good as I'd like to be about sending out that daily email. Sometimes uh, with things that get in the way, I'm not able, able to do that, but I try to do that every single day. So that's available for free at thefunnelspecialist.com. If people are interested in learning the methodology, the specific methodology that I've used to generate the 2.8 million leads, 175,000 customers in 17 different markets in the last 23 months, I teach that methodology at surveyfunnelformula.com. 
surveyfunnelformula.com. And like I mentioned, if you go to that page right here, right now, you're going to be directed to a little form that says the, cur the training is currently not available. Yeah. Enter your name and email to be notified the next time that it is made available. But if you're interested in diving deeper to learning the nuances of why this is so successful and how you can apply this specific methodology in your business, then I encourage anybody who's interested to go to surveyfunnelformula.com and to enter your information there to find out about the next time that the training is made available. Yeah, that's great. And you know, under when I release, uh, when we put the video, it'll be your name and then email. What email, or sorry, website, what website should I put under there, under your name on the actual whole video? So it's just a, you know, bottom third. What what uh, URL should I put? I would say thefunnelspecialist.com. Okay. Um, perfect. So Ryan, my last question for you, you know, since this is Inspired Insider, um, I want you to talk about one of your most painful moments in business and how you, what inspired you? What were you thinking about that motivated you to push forward through that? Because I think you know, a lot of people, we go through these things and I uh, want to know kind of what you were thinking about to, to get through those, some of those tough times. I'll give you two. So the first goes back to why I went into business for myself in the first place. And um, every time I tell the story, I start to get emotional about it. But basically, um, I was in my mid-20s, and I reached a point where I had achieved everything that I wanted to achieve. I, was, I had the job that I wanted at AIG. I was making the kind of money that I wanted. I was in this environment. I had 24 people reporting to me. I was running this entire division. I was, you know, spoke Chinese nearly fluently, and I had I'd achieved everything that I wanted to. And it was like this empty feeling. And I was inspired for some reason to basically stay up for 24 hours. And I wrote this like 20 page letter. This is embarrassing, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. 20 page letter that I just had, I wrote it to my mom, but it was really to myself. And basically it was that I had this flame inside of me and there was like this, this flame that was almost, uh, uh, ignite, you know, almost extinguished. Almost like when you see a fire and there's like that one last right, effort. Right. And I said that if I don't do something about this now, that that flame is going to be extinguished forever. And the flame was the fact that I had something more inside of me to build something bigger. And I wrote this huge letter, and I wrote it to my mom, and I, and I told my mom, don't freak out. But I just wanted to let her know that um, in the next 18 months, I was going to be quitting my job. I was going to be leaving this entire career behind, and I was going to be doing something. And I didn't know what it was yet. I hadn't figured everything out, but I had to do this. And I said, you just have to trust me on this. Um, that I'm making the right decision, that, that I had to, you know, to, to achieve that, um, that thing. And the thing that um, uh, really rang true to me was, was, was turning 30. For some reason, it was like when I had turned 30, if I had waited until I turned 30 at this time, that it would be too late, that at that time I would have had kids and settled down and I would be locked into this path where I right. couldn't escape the golden handcuffs of, of the corporate job that I had. Um, but I said that letter, I wrote that letter, wrote down my intention, set it aside, and as these things happen, within 18 months, I'd left the company and I'd started my first six-figure six business. That was the first thing. So it was that, that, that impending turning 30 that, that really struck me. The second thing happened more recently, which is when I um, uh, uh, you know, almost died, um, when I fell into diabetic ketoacidosis, found out that I was almost slipped into a coma and found out that I was a type 1 diabetic. And it was when I came to terms with my own mortality. At the time, my first son was, was only about six months old, hmm. and um, it was just uh, a real reality check um, that, um, and again, I'm going to be emotional talking about it, but yeah. it was, um, you, you were not around forever, you know? Yeah. And, um, it's a tough, t tough thing, especially when you have a young child, and you're like, I want to be there for their wedding and for other events, yeah. you know? And and if you're going to do what you're going to do, like, it's now, it's today, like, there's no, like, no someday, like, you know, get your ass in gear and just make it happen. Right. Um, and and be that that role model that you want to be for your kids, for everybody else. And right. and for me, more than anything else, it's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, every day I look at like, would my son be proud of me looking back? And, right. and I try to do that for that reason. So it's it's providing for my family. Um, but once you reach a certain point, I'm at a I've reached a, fortunately a level of success where the the money. It's, it's a score now. Like I have, I have everything that I could possibly want. Now it's more about doing the right thing, yeah. changing people's lives. As, as woo-woo as it sounds, it's true. And setting that example so that my kids will, you know, there's this thing that I've always been taught that people grow up and they look at their father in one of two ways. And I'll leave people with this, yeah. especially for the men in the audience. People either want to be the exact opposite of who their father is or they want to be exactly who their father is. It's this, this thing that we have, especially men, um, looking to our father. And, and, uh, and I want my kids to look at me and say, like, I, he's my role model. I want to be like him. And so yeah. that, more than anything else today, is what motivates me to, to 
pursue excellence and to push the envelope and to keep the foot on the accelerator and to keep going and 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 and, and kind of go down that path. So. Hopefully, I didn't mean to get emotional at the end I, like that, no, but it's, uh, no. it's the truth, and I hope yeah. it's, uh, it's guiding for people who kind of listen to this. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing, and the scary part is that is such a big thing to push you forward that you're just going to keep going. So, absolutely. Yeah, so Ryan, thank you so much. It's been it's awesome. absolutely amazing. This is one of the best. It's funny. Someone, I want to give a shout out to you before we wrap up because at Titans of Direct Response, this is like the creme de la creme of our industry. I told people that the people on stage speaking, any one of them could have been a keynote speaker at any normal event. And the people in attendance were all speaker quality people. So it was like the bar was raised one level. So these are people who are the creme de la creme. And someone in the audience, and I, I don't remember if it was Brian or Brian Kurtz who ran the event or someone else, basically said, Jeremy put together the best interview that he had ever uh, had. And I just want to give a shout out to you because I've done a lot of interviews myself and for whatever, you know, whatever it is, if it's your tone, the questions that you ask, your style, I feel like you're able to really drag out some true gold. And I just want to give you a shout out as an interviewer because I think you've become really a master of your craft and I applaud you for what you're doing. I think you found what you are, you know, what's your unique ability, what's, what you, you're destined to, to really be the best in the world at. So I just wanted to oh. hats off to you and give you a shout out. Oh, man. Thanks, Ryan. I'm humbled to hear that. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Awesome. Thank you.